here, and welcome to the Spiral Lab. Um, yeah, so welcome to my live stream uh, that I do every Thursday at 1 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time or Eastern Standard Time. Um, and I'm really happy to have you here. I always love to um, have a conversation with you. I know that it's mostly just me rambling on and on. That's kind of what I do here. <laughs> But um, I love as much as possible to be also having a conversation with you. So if you would um, f just feel free to like introduce yourself in the comments, if you're new, if you're old, and also if you have any thoughts as I'm talking, um, any questions, anything that it like sparks, anything that I say that sparks something in you, just feel free to chat away in the chat box. Um, and then I will sort of intermittently stop myself from um, babbling <laughs> and go read the go read the comments and and we'll have a conversation that way. I mean, it'd be way more fun if I could just ha have you all here in the room with me. Um, that's sort of a fantasy that like gather some of, um, the, especially the folks that have been around for a while and show up so frequently, um, and like actually have a conversation. Uh, and we could do that virtually. So maybe. That's one of the things that I'm working towards is being able to interview people. It's still just feeling a tiny bit technically daunting, and so I keep putting it off. Um, but anyway, enough preliminaries. The topic for today, um, I think I called it uh, in praise of dabbling, and also babbling, maybe. <laughs> uh, related, right? Anyway, in praise of dabbling. Um, and this, uh, I didn't even schedule the stream until this morning because I was sort of going back and forth, back and forth about what I wanted to talk about today. And I do have several ideas for other kinds of um, other uh, other live streams that I'm going to do that I was considering. But I had the most amazing experience on, um, on Monday that I want to tell you a little bit about, which sort of brought up some thoughts about dabbling and, and also like, um, some stories that I want to share with you, and also, um, yeah, so some some ways that I think that is related to our experience as neurodivergent people. So, sorry, I just had a little um, moment there where I sort of lost my train of thought. I think partly I'm just um, wondering if anybody's even out there, and if you are, I'd love to have you leave a comment in the chat box. Um, as I often say, it's hard for me to really believe that I'm talking to anybody until I see a, a comment in the chat box. Uh, but anyway, before I get into this topic of <clears throat> dabbling, um, and the role that I think that it can play, um, in our lives versus the way that it often is framed in our lives in a bad way. Um, but first, before I even get talking about that, oh, hi there. Um, so glad that a few people are saying hello. That's really, yay, okay, yay. Really, I can't tell you what a difference it makes um, in my ability to just speak, <laughs> to feel like there's actually people on the other side of the lens. Otherwise, I just feel kind of silly. I don't know what it is, but I just feel silly if I'm just talking into the void and there's literally no there, nobody there. But a mad doll is here and... Marshmallow Minion is here, and Samantha W is here. So nice to see you. Olive is here. Um, Kent S is here. Um, Yaro is here. Oh, I'm so excited to have Yaro here. So yeah, fantastic. Um, thank you all again for uh, for letting me know that you're here. It just super really helps. Uh, and then again, if you have any thoughts or comments or questions, don't hesitate to put them into the chat box as they occur to you. And I will intermittently now look back and forth from the chat um, to the to the camera <laughs> and, um, and, and engage in a conversation. I can't do, I can't, I'm just not very good at multitasking that way. So I can't like keep my train of thought if I'm really paying attention to the, um, to the comments. But now that I know that there's some people here, yay, it makes me so happy. Um, let me, let me sort of start over again. I want to talk about dabbling, um, and I want to share some experiences that I had recently, and some that sort of sparked some thoughts 
about um, the role of dabbling in my own life. Um, but before that, what I want to do is I want to talk about what I'm not saying, all right? Because I think that sometimes it's important to just sort of head the criticism off at the pass. Not that I'm not open to criticism or alternate perspectives, but sometimes people like get in the comments and argue with me about things that I'm not actually saying. Um, so I just want to be clear about what I'm not saying. All right, what I'm not, this is not a diatribe against anything. It's not um, against practice or expertise or consistency or excellence or professionalism or any of those things. Um, and in fact, I actually think, as with so many things, somewhat counterintuitively, that if those things matter to you, practice and expertise and consistency and excellence, if those things matter to you and are things that you strive for in your life, I actually think that dabbling um, without shame <laughs> and without sort of the toxic self-talk and self-criticism that we often have about our dabbling, I think that it can, if you want it to, lead to those things, can sort of help um, under create a sort of foundation for, or a, a somewhat spirally, um, I'll, admittedly, but spirally path towards those things. Um, so, but I just want to be clear that I am, this is not me saying you shouldn't try to get really good at something or you shouldn't um, seek expertise in some, in a field or a, a medium that really matters to you or that you, sh that excellence doesn't matter. That's not what I'm saying. Um, uh, okay. So just like, let's just put that aside for a second um, and talk about what I am talking about. Um, and, and I, the, the, the word dabble came to me sort of of its own volition when I was having these thoughts um, in relation to the story that I'm going to tell you about in a little bit. But then I was like, what does that really mean, dabble? Um, like, do you ever use a word <laughs> and you're pretty sure that you're using it right, but you're not actually sure that you could define it <laughs> um, if you are called on? So I actually looked it up, the word dabble, and there's... There's interestingly two definitions that were given just on the, in the online dictionary, and I kind of loved both of them. Um, it's the second one that is specifically what I'm talking about, but it's related to the first, right? So the first definition of dabble is to immerse one's hands or feet partially in water and move them around gently. Like, doesn't that sound nice? Like, how how could we have any... How could there be anything bad about dabbling, right? If it just means like putting your hands and feet in the water and moving them around gently. Um, the second one, though, is what I'm thinking of. Um, and, and so just let me read the definition. It's to take part in an activity in a casual or superficial way. Um, and that, that definition is definitely what I'm thinking about when I say dabble. And I think that um, the word superficial in that definition kind of gets at the kind of negative connotation that we often have around the, um, the concept of dabbling. Like, like there's definitely something a little, I don't know, I think that there's something a little shameful about dabbling in our society right? Like we're meant to be serious and we're meant to, um, you know, finish, finish what we start and put our nose to the grindstone. And, um, you know, you hear lots of stuff about it takes a 10,000 hours of practice to get good at something. Um, and again, I'm not disputing any of that. And I'm not even saying that you shouldn't try to put in those reps to get really good at something. But I do think that that is very much sort of the only thing that is seen as kind of valuable in our society. Um, and that the notion of kind of dabbling in something has this kind of negative connotation. Um, let me know if you, if, you, if you feel that, if you feel that sort of negative connotation in the idea of dabbling. Like it's a set, there's a sort of sense of like you're not serious 
Um, you're not hardworking enough. You're not committed enough um, when you dabble in something. And I think that one of the things that happens to many of us neurodivergent people is that our dabbling gets sort of reframed, but not in a good way, or maybe deframed, deformed, <laughs> um, as qu we quit, as being fickle, as abandoning things, never finishing things. Um, and later on, I want to talk about how um, the shame... The shame of that, then, I think, um, in again, in a sort of counterintuitive way, the we we feel ashamed of dabbling, and that that and, and what that's supposed to do is lead us to f more commitment, um, more endurance, more ability to um, put in the reps and get excellent. But in fact, it has exactly the opposite effect. So I'm going to talk about that in a little bit too. Um, I don't know if you were here last week for my live stream when I completely lost my notes. <laughs> I actually didn't lose them. They're right over there uh, in one of the cubbies. I just couldn't, I didn't think to look at that when I was looking for them. But anyway, um, I do have some notes, just a few, but um, they sort of keep me on track because otherwise I could, I mean, I know that you guys don't mind when I get sort of babbly and spirally and in fact maybe that's part of what you come for but I do like to like keep myself a tiny bit on track <laughs> so anyway um so what got me started about all this is that uh something that I dabbled in a while ago several years ago has sort of come full circle uh in a in a really unexpected way uh that has, that has been just kind of um lovely. And so it made me think, like this experience that I just had made me start to think about um, the dabbling that I did that brought me full circle recently and all of the like good stuff that came of it. And the, and the fact that I've been feeling until just recently, until just the other day, been feeling kind of ashamed of it. I, I didn't even realize that I was feeling ashamed of it, but I but I was, and it was holding me back. It was holding me back in lots of ways. So, um, so I want to talk. So, so, so the dabbling um, that I did uh, just to started dipped my toes in, um, as you will, uh, was uh, becoming a visual artist. Like I'm even I'm even hesitant to like take that to call myself a visual artist because I only ever dabbled in it. <laughs> um, and I, and I will never, you know, like have a, a big solo exhibition and I will never probably sell art and monetize it. Um, but we have to get over that. We have to stop, um, feeling like we can't call ourselves something just because we're only da only dabblers. Right. So anyway, I just want to tell you the story of my um, taking on visual art, even though, as it turns out, I was just dabbling and continue to just dabble, um, and and what it has meant. Like the, I want to talk about sort of the intrinsic, immediate value of it, the intrinsic pleasures of it. And I also want to talk about the sort of ripple effects that it had in other areas of my life and how eventually it has brought me back around to a form of art that I think, I could be wrong, I'm not sure, feels like an area where I do actually want to seek some expertise. Um, so anyway, enough preamble. Um, I actually am going to go look at the, there's a bunch of comments, I'm going to go look at the um, comments and then I'm going to just... Um, I'm going to just tell you my story. Okay. Um, but wow, you guys have got so many great comments. Marshmallow Minion is having coffee, knitting and taking mental notes. I heartily approve of all of that. Not that you need my approval, but um, coffee, knitting and mental notes. Some of my favorite things. <laughs> um, 
Kent is here, Yarrow. Okay. Um, Kent says that seems to stem from our American work ethic. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about that, about, um, uh, in college, I read the book by Max Weber called, uh, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. And I'm getting really interested in that again and may want to um, revisit that. But yes, uh, there is a sort of, there is a, there is this like Protestant work ethic, American work ethic. I think they're related. And I think it's especially, like, I think it's all of capitalism, but it's especially insidious, I think, in the United States. Um, Marsh, Marshmallow Minion says, I think this is in response to my question about whether or not there's this negative connotation to, to the sense of dabbling and the, the use of the word superficial in the definition. Um, they say people can use it that way, but after 30 plus years of making, crafting, all those dabbling skills have led to expertise in other crafts. Exactly. Exactly. And I do want to, I want to get to that marshmallow minion and I'd love to hear more about your story. Um, I, I think, yes, I'm going to get to that in just a little bit. Um, Olive says, definitely. I think a feature of capitalism is the idea that all hobbies pursuits are only valued if they can be mastered and monetized. 100%. Um, I totally agree with that. And I think that that's part of what makes it, makes us reluctant to waste time on things that are that aren't going to lead to income is that is exactly that spirit yeah um mad doll says dabbling is often framed as casual unemployment waste of time exactly you're reading my mind um but dabbling is the best way to gain ex experience right exactly and i think that um what i one of the i do really want to separate this into um the intrinsic value, because I do think that even it's like, it's a lot like my thoughts on rest. Like I think that rest um, and our need for rest and our um, desire for rest and our uh, right to rest is, is absolute and true in and of itself. And the same with dabbling. Like I think the pleasures of it are just valuable in and of themselves. And also, they may lead to other things, um, as Marshmallow Minion is saying, and I agree with that 100%, and I'm going to talk about that. But I, but I also really want to emphasize that even if they didn't lead to other things, even if they didn't like give us ex like um, skills that then get transferred to other areas that where we do have expertise, I mean, it wouldn't matter. It's enough just that they're that they are valuable and the dabbling. Um, for the, just for the pleasure of it is uh, is valuable in and of itself. Samantha says, I've tried such a diverse range of things in my life, but I cannot access pride in that because I only ever dabbled and quit or didn't continue those things. Yeah, Samantha, that's something that that's exactly what I'm going to get at, right? Because I'm the same way. Um, but I, th but I think that we need to figure out how to reclaim our right to be proud of those things and um, and to reclaim our right to like claim them right as ours, even if we never became excellent in them or never, or didn't continue to do them really consistently over time. Um, spiral nerd says mm, dabbling definition one, the, I, the notion of like, dangling your feet and hands into water and just sort of gently moving them around, splashing them around is one of my favorite sensory experiences. Me too. <laughs> um, which is, I think part of why when I saw the definition of it, I was so taken with it and I was like, Oh yes, we're going to take back dabbling, <laughs> which is making me think about approaching dabbling definition too, as a site of pleasure and joy, sensory, intellectual, etc. Again, spiral nerd, totally reading my mind. Um, Yes, all of that. Olive says, I agree it's a good way to get experience. It's also a good way to figure out what you like by trying different things. All of that. All of that. And also a site of pleasure and joy in and of itself, even if it doesn't get us anything else. Like, I think that, that um, I just think that this sort of work ethic of, of capitalism and neoliberal is so it was so pernicious about it is that um 
and then it like piles shame on us for the things that we're not necessarily good at, but it also makes us believe that the only things that have value are the things that ultimately, you know, like we, we sort of contort things so that we, um, so that we can somehow find some long-term monetizable value in it. And we forget that like pleasure for its own sake can be valuable joy for its own sake, sensory experiences just for their own sake are also valuable and like an in, integral part of being human, I believe. Um, um, okay, I'm going to, um, I'm just going to mark that and quit there for a minute uh, because, because I realized that there's so many, there's so many great comments. Thank you so much for jumping into the chat box. That always makes me so happy. Um, Oh, I, I guess there's a couple things here that I just wanted to note. Um, Marshmallow Minion is um, noting that kids dabble, that we don't shame them, we encourage it. And then Yaro says, similarly, dabbling is allowed and acceptable when it comes to children. But when you're an adult, you're suddenly not allowed to explore and grow. Yeah. Um, uh, let me, um, just a couple more of these things. Mad Doll says, I saw a quote recently. Let me share it. Here is a secret about things you love. If you put them down, you can always pick them back up again. You can always paint again, sew again, hike again, play music again, read that book again, watch the movie. But it's been so long. The thing you love doesn't care, right? Oh, that's really nice. I like that. Um, I like that a lot. And I think that this notion that like the dabbling is something that we allow for children, but that suddenly... Um, that suddenly we're not allowed to do anymore as an adult. I think that's a really important, an important point um, that, that we should, that, that we should, that like, I guess part of the vulnerability of embracing ourselves is also allowing ourselves to be a little bit more childlike and to play and to not, um, I mean, of course, children are also like really oppressed in the society. So, you know, it it's both and. Anyway, um, I'm going to come back to a few more here. Um, actually, let me just do this last one. Alina says, it helps me to remember we are all going to die. Is the point of life really to prove mastery to other people in our short time here? It feels like enjoying life is a valid goal too. Yes. 100%. And I think that I really do understand you because people sometimes think that I'm really morbid when I talk about the fact that like, like we're all going to die. <laughs> um, but I do think that somehow it helps like give me a little perspective in my own life. Like, what am I going to, what am I going to look back on and wish I had done more of when I am on my deathbed? And I suspect that dabbling is going to be high on the list. Um, not necessarily being an expert and with my nose to the grindstone, right? All right, so let me tell you, um, let me tell you this story. So as many of you know, um, I went through a really difficult time several years ago. I was in the midst of a divorce and um, moving around, like I moved three times in two years and moving is just like really treacherous for me. And um, there's a lot of upheaval um, in my children's lives, which was difficult, um, and that I was contributing to, I was in a really financially difficult place. Like it was just a really traumatic time for me. And I had in the midst of that, a really serious mental health crisis. And I was getting, I was like very fortunate. I had, I was working with a psychiatrist who was also my, who was, who was managing my many medications at the time. And also, um, was my therapist. And I had a new partner who was enormously supportive and, um, you know, lots of, I had lots of good support, but it was a really difficult time. Very, very, very difficult time. Um, and I've always been a writer. I've always written, um, and thought of myself as a writer. I've especially written like essays, um, both sort of expository and personal narrative type essays. And also, um, a bit later in life, I came to writing fiction, but writing was kind of like, 
at the core of who I was, I'm very verbal. I, um, I process things verbally. Uh, and in the midst of all that, well, two things happened. One is that I just sort of felt like I lost access to words. Like I couldn't find pleasure in them. I couldn't like, I, I couldn't muster the kind of attention span that it took to put to string, and I, again, I'm talking as, uh, about writing, to string sentences together into paragraphs and to, to form ideas or to, or to paint scenes with words in fiction. Like it just all kind of escaped me for a while there. And it was really disorienting because it was very much writing and words and language were very much at the heart of who I am. Um, and so it was very disorienting. And at the same time, I was starting to become familiar with and immersed in the in various neurodivergent communities, um, ADHD and then autism, and was becoming familiar with the concept of unmasking, um, which is, you know, this, the, the, um, what does I have it right here? The, um, the topic of Devin Price's new book, which you should read, called um, Unmasking Autism, this concept that we are forced often by our society, by the expectations of our families, our schools, our workplaces, society in general, to almost wear a mask in order to hide our true selves, like the sort of weirdness of our the, I only mean, I mean weirdness in the best possible way, but the ways that we're different that seem weird to the rest of the world, to the neurotypical world, um, that we're required to hide those things behind a mask in order to get on rather than being accommodated for our differences. And um, the process of, of like discovering that you've been wearing a mask for a really long time and then deciding to like try to start taking that mask off and being more real and more who you are, or at least feeling like you're entitled to do that when you choose, um, can be a really powerfully liberating part of coming to understand ourselves as neurodivergent people. And for me, it was. Um, but part of that unmasking process for me like actually, at least initially, kind of um, contributed to the to the mental health crisis I was having because what what happened was that as I started to think about like, oh my God, I've been sort of like walking through my life with a mask on and kind of faking it for so long. I thought when I just take my mask off, then the real me will appear. And what I realized is that the real I didn't know who the real me was. I didn't know who I was under that mask and it resulted in some like really serious kind of like periods of dissociation and derealization and just feeling like I wasn't even sure if I actually existed, if there was any there there. It was very, <laughs> it was again, very disorienting. And then combined with the fact that words were escaping me, um, I, I just felt this enormous urge to, make some sort of art. And the only thing that felt available to me was to make visual art. Um, so, so I guess it wasn't, I mean, I think that it's in retrospect that I think of it as dabbling. I mean, at the time it kind of felt like I was saving my own life or creating my, my own self. Right. So, um, but the upshot is that I had never in a million years thought of myself as a visual artist. I had never, certainly never thought of myself as somebody who, who was capable of drawing realistically or painting um, portraits um, or anything kind of realistic. And I didn't even really have a, a strong sense of like color and composition and the kinds of, um, you know, things that go into abstract art. But it was just this like need inside of me welled up and I just started making art, visual art, painting and sketching and doing collage and things like that. Um, again, sort of out of this like 
need to kind of both save and create myself. <laughs> uh, but I, but, but the initial impulse wasn't necessarily to become good at it. But then I sort of had this idea that like, oh, uh, maybe I could learn some of these things. And so as I started healing and feeling better about myself, I did actually like take a little online class about drawing and um, found this, which was really fascinating because it turns out that, that like you can learn how to draw, like anybody can learn how to draw. Um, and I think that we all should learn how to draw. I think that it's probably just as important as learning how to write. And I'll talk about why in just a minute. Um, but I also found this, I went down a bunch of rabbit holes and I found this one, uh, a couple of art sites by painters. One was a portrait painter and another was an abstract painter. And like they, like they talked about um, painting and about paints and about color and composition and brush strokes and I don't know it was just so fascinating and I like kind of like went down a rabbit hole with it and started to think about of myself like as a visual artist as a painter and um and at the in the midst of this in the midst of sort of playing around with all of this um I learned of this organization in Philadelphia called the Souls Shot Portrait Project, um, which is an organization that pairs visual artists with the families of people who have been killed through gun violence. Um, and I don't know if you know this about Philadelphia, but we have so much gun violence in Philly. I think that like right now we might be like the leading site of um, deaths by gun violence and um, and but it's always been true that it's just a terrible scourge right now uh, or not right now always in Philadelphia and so this organization was just trying to like um, create both awareness but also kind of personify the victims so they weren't just like names and numbers um, so anyway I thought when I look back on it I think why did I think that I was capable of painting a portrait for this project. I had painted one portrait pr prior to that, which is a portrait of my son, which is actually right here on my wall, um, which I painted in like an hour. Like it just came really fast and I can show it to you in a minute. I love this portrait of my son, but it's not by like any sort of, um, I don't know, conventional artistic standards, anything, you know, to write home about. Uh, but anyway, for some reason, I like I had this sense of myself now as like, I could do that. I could make a portrait of somebody. And so I applied to the project and they just wanted to see a few of my sketches. And I didn't really like I had a sketchbook with a few sketches in it. I didn't really have a portfolio at all, but I showed them what I had and they accepted me into the project. And um, and I was paired with this woman whose son had been killed. His name was James. And I painted a portrait of J James. And it was kind of wild because I didn't know that I was capable of that. And, and I'm pretty proud of it, actually. And I wish that I had, I could pull up a um, photo for you. Um, I, I, I can't <laughs> right now um, because I'm not that nimble um, with all the tech side of this soft, you know, the streaming software. But, um, and I should have thought of it ahead of time, but I didn't. But anyway, I painted this portrait of James. It, it went into the exhibition and, um, and it was kind of cool, a cool thing. James's mother loves it. Um, and eventually it will be hers. But, um, but the full circle thing that happened is the, so I painted a portrait of my son. I painted a portrait of this young man named James. And that, those are the only portraits that I ever painted. And I, you know, I made some, a few abstract pieces and I never followed through with it at all. Um, and I, I very much want to get back to it. Uh, and in fact, I've set up a whole art studio downstairs in my living, what used to be my living room um, to make space for that. But I haven't been doing it. I haven't been making art and I've been feeling kind of bad about that and wondering why am I not making art? Um, 
so um, this is like not a, a super linear story. So I'm just trying to decide like what's the, ne the next best place to go. Um, well, first, first I just want to talk to you about the, um, I want to talk to you about sort of the immediate and intrinsic value that that little period of my life of dabbling in visual art and abstract painting and especially portrait painting, the effect that it had on me at the time, um, that, that just in and of itself seems to me would be plenty valuable. And then I'm going to talk about, um, kind of the ripple effects that it had and the way that just recently it kind of came full circle in this kind of amazing experience that I had on Monday. Um, but the, just the immediate value, the immediate intrinsic value was, as I said, it was like something that was available to me when I had no words. So that alone was enough, right? And that it was so important to me in um, making visual art became so important to me as a part of, like I've often said that when I took my mask off and realized that the self that was underneath, that I thought would be there instantly underneath wasn't actually as clear <laughs> as I thought it was going to be. Then I was sort of faced with the task of creating myself. Um, and that art was so central to that. Um, and so I will always feel about that period of time when I was dabbling in visual art and abst um you know, especially portrait painting and abstract painting. Like I will always look back on that as sort of the, the time that I kind of made myself, I created myself, like it, I've created the art, but, it, but through the art, I healed myself and created myself. So it was really powerful experience. Um, but in addition to that, like it gave, like, like learning some fundamentals of of art, of visual art, um, helps me to understand things about perspective and about color and composition. Um, and it, like, I think that I've always loved those things, but I didn't know why. And it helped me to kind of have a, um, more of an explanation of many other things that I love that give me enormous pleasure in my life. Um, and it also just gave me this sense of pride. Like at the time I felt enormous pride that I could do this thing that I never in a million years thought that I could do. Um, and that was so pleasurable for me. And it made me feel like, Oh, maybe I have some capacity. Maybe I'm capable. Like I really, at that time in my life just was so shredded. It was so crushed that I really kind of like I had lost a job. I didn't know what I was going to do to support myself. Um, and, and it gave me the sense like, oh, I am capable of making things. And even though making many more portraits was not where I went with that, it still gave me that sense and was really powerful. Um, and then, you know, and then there were these ripple effects too, after the fact, um, in that it, it like helped me to understanding perspective and color and shape and composition and all of that has really made me notice the world in a really different way. Like this is why I think everybody should learn how to draw. Um, because when you learn, learn how to draw, you learn something about perspective and you learn something about seeing the world in a different way than, um, than we normally do. Like you have to kind of, um, see it differently in order to draw it. Uh, and, and it's hard for me to explain what that, what I mean by that, but, um, but it's, but it was, it proved kind of profound to me, like the, the, the literal understanding of like perspective in drawing also opened up this new way of just seeing the world in general, like gave me a different perspective on seeing the world, um, and noticing it and finding pleasure in it. And so, um, yeah, and it also helps me to understand other people's art. Like I now sort of understood a little bit better 
what I was looking at, which also sort of, again, counterintuitively allowed me to let go of trying to understand it and just kind of immerse myself in it. I guess what, what making art did for me was helped me to, to understand that understanding isn't really what it's all about. Um, and it let me just gave me permission to just kind of feel my way into the experience of other people's art. Whereas before it had been like a real intellectual kind of endeavor for me that never felt very satisfying. So it really also opened up the world of art to me as just, just this pleasurable sensory experience. Um, and it, it also like, it, you know, I, that portrait, the, between the two portraits that I've made, they've been um, in now in like three different shows, um, three different exhibitions um, in my city and neighborhood. And that, you know, in and of itself got me out a little bit, connected me with a local art gallery. Like, like I learned, I met some people and that's always a good thing for me because I'm such a hermit. Um, so those were some of the sort of ripple effects of, my dabbling in the visual arts. Um, but that all kind of culminated. Um, hold on, I just want to read my notes. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, culminated on Monday. So uh, just a little while ago, I'd had the, the portrait of James, of the young man who was shot, returned to me. And I was about to give it to his mother. Um, but we hadn't like made a plan yet to connect and hand it off. And in the meantime, I got an email from the original, the, the folks at the original project, the souls shot portrait project saying that um, the guy who's in charge of like arts um, and in the city of Philadelphia and who, um, who puts together exhibitions of artists in City Hall um, had contacted Soul Shot and wanted to um, put together an exhibition of portraits that had been part of that program. Um, and so if we wanted, we could donate our, we could lend our portraits to the, um, to the City Hall exhibition. And then here were a bunch of like window drop off dates and the windows at which we could go drop them off at City Hall. Um, and so I thought, okay, why not? Like, and I contacted James's mom and she was fine with it. So we decided that we would loan James's portrait to this exhibition in City Hall. Um, and of course, I waited until the very last day um, <laughs> uh, to take the portrait down. And, um, and I said I had intended to get there early on, but... Um, but of course was late, um, as is my way. And, um, and interestingly, um, I had just recently decided to start vlogging a little bit, um, which we'll see if that actually happens, right? Whether I actually put any vlogs together and put them up on the channel. Let me know if you'd be interested in seeing some vlogs from me. Um, but I was going to try to vlog this journey downtown with the with the painting, but like nothing was working. Like, my f phone tripod was broken. There's just a million reasons why, why it didn't work. Um, and I was kind of frustrated by it, but whatever. And I got down there, um, and went in and, uh, there was another woman also leaving her stuff off. And I made some casual comment about how, uh, Oh, that maybe, a, um, maybe I'd be able to vlog the, I guess there's going to be some sort of opening of the show or a, an event where they invite artists. And I thought I said, Oh, I was hoping to vlog this for my YouTube channel. Um, but maybe I'll do it instead on that day. Right. Um, and then people started asking like, uh, Oh, what is your YouTube channel about? And I had that moment where I was like, I don't know. Do I explain to them? Do I try to explain to them what my YouTube channel is about? Um, or do I just sort of, um, it's like that sort of coming out moment. Right. Um, but I did, I explained it and it, it turns out that they totally knew what neurodivergence was and this woman's kid is neurodivergent and blah, blah, blah. 
we ended up having this amazing conversation. And it turns out that this woman um, who is also donating her art to this show and who has a neurodivergent non-binary child um, lives in my neighborhood and not only just lives in my neighborhood, but is opening up an amazing art center, a nonprofit art center right in my neighborhood that is like right up, like exactly the sort of thing that I have dreamed of doing myself, but have never had the bandwidth or the organizational skills um, or the social skills to do. But like, it's just a really exciting project. She seems like just a really solid, interesting, amazing, creative person herself. Um, and it, and it seems possible that I might be able to partner with her in her new um, art center to do some of the stuff that we do virtually in Divergent Design Studios and here on the Spiral Lab to do that like um, in real life. Like I hate that I hate that expression because this is real life too. But do you know what I mean? Face to face and bodies in the same room, brick and mortar kind of thing. Um, so it just felt like this amazing thing that had come full circle. Um, and when I got back, I was telling Joel about this amazing experience I'd had, this amazing, oh, it, it, I ended up giving her a ride home because she had Ubered to the, um, to the courthouse because she doesn't like driving downtown. Um, so, you know, we really connected and I was telling Joel all about this. And then like I had this notion that I just realized as I was telling him, like I started to get this sort of rising anger in me both at myself and also at our society, because I realized that I've been feeling ashamed about the fact that I don't make that kind of art anymore. And in fact, like, wasn't even sure that I was, that like I had the right to loan the portrait to this exhibit in City Hall, because who am I? I'm not really an artist. You know, like everybody else has got their artist statements and they've got their portfolios and their websites with with all of their art on it, whether it's for sale or not. Like the, uh, I had the sense that, oh, the other artists are serious artists and the, and they will, they have continued to make art and I haven't, or at least not that kind of art. Um, and I was feeling kind of, I realized that I was feeling some shame about that. Um, and especially about the fact that like I set up this art studio downstairs and haven't really used it um, to make that kind of art. And in fact, I've been kind of feeling um, lately that like wondering, am I even an artist? Like, or am I just somebody, just somebody who facilitates other people's art, who like creates space and holds space and um, helps them get rid of their shame and, you know, all the things that I, lo I love doing and teaches. Um, like I've been, I've been really kind of struggling with this lately, this, this sense that, um, that maybe I'm not really an artist. Maybe I'm just like a poser. <laughs> uh, I, I guess it's sort of an imposter syndrome kind of thing, but I guess I kind of thought I was over all of that. Like I, I'm always amazed at how, like no matter how much you heal, like this stuff will just keep coming back to bite you in the butt. I do feel like I, I catch it earlier and I notice it and I can often um, disrupt it. But, um, but in fact, uh, in fact, I had just before, um, just the week before had actually filmed something for a vlog that I was thinking about making where I was talking about exactly this and had come to the insight in that vlog, which I may or may not put up on the channel. Let me know if you would like me to do that. Um, where I had this insight that, uh, that part of the problem wasn't just that I wasn't making art, but that, um, that I didn't have any, any kind of instant gratification in my life anymore that I am trying to make art. I'm trying to make long form art, um, in the form of video essays. Uh, but that is, a, those are much bigger, longer projects and that there isn't that kind of like instant gratification that comes from certainly from Instagram content, but also even from just like putting paint, 
paint on a canvas, like even if it's not finished, you, there's something to see, right? Like there's nothing to see when you're spending months doing research and educating yourself about an entirely new field and trying to learn how to take notes effectively um, because you've got shame about that from your past. And, um, and then also struggling to learn how to use all of the gear and the tech side of it and trying to learn how to edit in like any kind of sophisticated professional editing software. Um, so what I realized when I was recording this vlog, the, the vlog that I may or may not put up on the channel, um, was that I am making art, um, but there's no instant gratification. And so part of the impetus for doing a vlog was both to force myself to learn how to edit, but also, um, to, to like have something to show for all my work occasionally while I'm doing these longer form projects. And so, so I don't know if you're seeing the connection here. It's, it's all clear in my mind. The connection is that I had been vlogging about feeling like I'm not an artist. And then when I went to this, to drop off my art, which I almost didn't do because of the shame I felt, I mentioned the vlog and the, and the failure of the vlog that I had hoped to make about dropping the art off. Um, and that was what sort of opened up this conversation that introduced me to several people. It wasn't just this one woman, but um, two other people who are also in the room live in my neighborhood, are doing amazing things. There's some grant funding out there. Like there's just like, it was one of those synergistic moments where you think, well, what if I had actually gotten here when I thought I was gonna get here? Or what if I had come early and not waited until the last minute? This like, this moment of connection wouldn't have happened. Um, and I was just so glad it did it, but it was all connected. It was connected to my shame and it was connected to um, my sense that I'm maybe not an artist and then vlogging about that and then talking about vlogging. Like it was just one of those moments where all of these things opened up all of a sudden and it felt so vibrant and so exciting and so alive and who knows what's going to come of it. Um, but it was just a moment just like ripe with potential and creativity and connection. And, and what I realized is that none of it would have happened, but for my dabbling, <laughs> my dabbling in being a visual artist a couple of years ago. Right. And, and not only that, but nothing would have come of it if I hadn't overcome my initial sort of shameful impulse to make myself small, to discredit myself, to, um, to not feel the right to claim my, that identity as an artist because I only merely dabbled in it. Um, so I don't know if, I feel like this is maybe one of the most meandering and kind of weird live streams that I've ever done. <laughs> I could be wrong. I actually thought about putting it off for a week so that it would digest a little bit because this really did just happen. Um, but, but anyway, um, yeah, so, so all of that, all of that, like the dabbling led to all of that, but also not just that I'm noticing my notes and, and realizing that it wasn't just that moment and the connections that I made that happened on account of it. But in fact, the dabbling in visual arts, in painting um, and portraiture is, is very much related to video making for me. And, it, um, and I'm not sure that I would have like I dabbled in video making too for a while and abandoned that also. But now I'm what I'm coming back around to is not like, oh, I'm going to be a portrait artist and start taking that seriously. I mean, I do want to paint portraits, but I just want to do it for my pleasure. But what I want to really get good at, I think, is making videos. And to me, when I lost, when I felt like I lost my capacity to, 
um, to use words effectively in the written form. Um, video became something that was possible. And this live stream is also a result of that. Like, it's just so much easier sometimes for me to talk than for me to write. Um, so, so it feels like, uh, that what a video is, is the written word, but with also, uh, visual imagery layered on top of it. And also sound like there's just graphics, texts as art. Like there's so many layers, um, that are possible in video, uh, and that I'm getting really excited about again, especially now that um, I am, in fact, um, learning a little bit about editing in a more sophisticated way. And it's it's a it's a a steep hill. <laughs> it's a steep, steep learning curve for me to wrap my head around a, an editing software like Premiere Pro. But um, but Jesse Meadows, my friend and YouTube partner, is helping me to learn how to do that. And I have this idea that while I'm making these longer form videos, while I'm learning how to do that and doing all the research and writing the scripts and um, learning how to use the equipment and all of the rest of it, that I could make these, that maybe I could make sort of smaller vlogs about kind of the process and about my internal process um, that would be sort of quick and dirty and give me some instant gratification. But again, I'm not sure that I would have come back around to video without first dabbling in art and having in visual art and having that as a, a layer to put on top of or to integrate with um, the written word, which has very much started to come back, has become more and more available to me but it's all of a piece. So it had, so to sum up, it had like intrinsic value at the time. Um, and if nothing good had ever come of it, nothing after the fact had ever come of it, if it hadn't brought me to this moment on Monday with these people in my community, if it hadn't um, been an important part of the thing that I did eventually land on, which I do think is video making, um, even if none of that had happened, it would have had value in and of itself, but it also had all of these other amazing effects, all from dabbling. Um, and so I just wanted to like, this is just sort of a love song to dabbling. And I think that, that, that when we take away the, sh and this is like my mantra about everything, right? When we take away the shame, um, and start to see it for what it is and value it for what it is. So often, um, all sorts of things get opened up and freed up. Um, yeah, and so many things become possible. So I think that that's the end of what I have to say, but now I wanna um, go look at your comments and if you have more comments, Feel free to keep adding them. Um, let's see. All right. Spiral Nerd says, the kids dabbling comments make me think about how curiosity, wonder, and play seem to be things we're expected to let go of as we become adults. I feel like we have so much to learn from kids, right? Um, and that the wisdom of kids is super undervalued in micro and macro systemic ways. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, and as, and as someone who has sort of heartbreakingly watched two amazing kids, I mean, two amazing kids grow up into two amazing adults, but the kind of damage, that it got done along the way, even with, you know, even with parents who were largely open um, and supportive and, and un sort of understood where they were coming from and weren't trying to conform them. Even so, um, the damage that happens is kind of amazing. 
Mad Doll says, yes, spiral nerd, being shoved in a box and molded to be good workers and then spending the later years part of our lives unlearning all that. Play is marketed back to us as if it's radical, but it's innate. Yeah, I mean, that that's sort of the definition, right, of an industrial complex, and it's the thing that neoliberalism is so good at doing, is like taking away the very basic human needs that we have and then um, selling it back to us <laughs> um, as self-help or self-care or play. Um, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Ken says STEM classes are important, but not to the detriment of art classes in middle school and high school. I would hyper focus in art class and not want to leave. Yeah, and I think that one of the, I agree with you, Kent. And I also think that, um, I also think that like it's the sort of separation out. Like I, th I think that they're all important and that they're all like, connected. And if we could like create a space where kids could just, where kids and adults could be curious designers. I talk about that a lot, right. Um, in all of those areas and, and not like we, we put things in such rigid silos, you know, disciplines, subject matter. And, and those are really false um, categories that we create. For the convenience of other people, not for the convenience of us as makers and um, and artists. Julie says, maybe you are a multi-potential type person who can interact with media and making make a satisfying visual statement, but not want to spend the many hours, usually alone, to be a committed visual artist. Yeah, with quotation marks about around committed visual artist. I think that um, I think that for me. I mean, I, I think that for me, I don't have enough passion for visual art or for, say, portraiture. To just, I do think that, like I said at the very beginning of this, this is not a diatribe against practice or expertise or consistency or excellence. Like, I, I'm, I do admire people who put in the reps, who... You know, you know, like spend the hours and hours and hours doing the thing that it takes to get better. Like I agree with that, 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 that if you want to get really good at something, it really does take like hours and hours and years and years of practice to do those things. I think that for me, um, making visual art, painting especially, is just not the thing that I'm passionate enough about to do that with. Um, but I, but I, I think that, and I, and I guess I don't actually think that you need to, like, I think it's fine to just live a life of dabbling too. Like, I don't think that, I don't think it has to be binary, right? It doesn't have to be either or, like either you're, um, or, the, or good and bad, right? That like, like it's fine if you dabble, but it, uh, only if it leads to serious, something serious down the road. Um, I'm not even saying that. I think that a lot of people just want to dabble. Like a whole lifetime of dabbling is a life, is a, a life well spent in my mind. Um, I mean, I'm glad that some people do get obsessively passionate about things and do them over and over and over and get really, really good at it. Like there's something really satisfying about do, both doing that and about watching it in other people and like there's something really awesome about what results from that kind of intensive work. Um, I'm like, I'm not, I think that in my life, the thing that I have practiced most in my life and that I'm most good at is probably something that is a little bit nebulous and for which there isn't actually, um, like I think it's more about, creating space and community and connection, making connections, connecting ideas, connecting people. Um, and, and that's, that's, that's fine too. Right. Um, but I do think that if there's some sort of, um, making some sort of art making that has, uh, like an artifact, like a thing that gets done at the end of it. For me, that's going to be, um, 
that's going to be video, I think. But I, like, like I don't even want to declare that because who knows? Maybe I'm going to like lose steam with that and um, move on to something else. And maybe video too will will end up being just another thing that I dabbled in. But I, I guess, I guess the upshot is that um, I do like. I do like feeling a sense of expertise and I do like being consistent and committing to a practice. Like those are all really, um, yeah, they're things that I really enjoy and that I value. But I think that, that um, portrait painting and abstract painting are not going to be the th those things for me. Um, and I think that what I had, what I had felt until just recently was that, Oh, well then, I can't call myself a visual artist. I can't call myself a painter. And why the hell did I devote a whole room in my house to making visual art um, if I'm not really serious about it? And I think that part of this kind of like love song to dabbling this um, is simply giving myself permission, much less you all, to, to call myself a visual artist, to call myself a painter, to make, to make paint, paintings even if nobody's ever going to buy them, even if I'm never going to earn a living from them, even if they're never going to be shown anywhere, like just because it's fun, because I enjoy it. Right. Um, so anyway, yeah. Uh, Julie also says, yeah, that I'm doing that kind of deep dive with other things. Exactly. Exactly. Um, anyway, I don't know if, the, if, like I said, that feels like one of the most, um, spirally, weird, kind of rambly uh, uh, live streams that I've ever done. And I'm feeling a tiny bit distracted here, but um, I'm not seeing any more comments. So thank you all for coming. And if you do think of other comments, feel, or if you're watching this as a recording, feel free to like the video and to put your comments below. Um, and we can have a conversation there as well. Um, and yeah. Thanks. I really appreciate you being here. All right. Bye.